So today I'm going to talk about the long, slow road um, to the Sargasso. Um, I'm going to try and tell you a story um, about eel tracking um, over the years. Um, and I'd, I'd like to start with this uh, piece of art here. This is, um, this is drawn um, and um, coloured by an artist called Peter Gander from the east of England. Um, he, he made this for us um, for the 2012 uh, World Fisheries Congress. Um, and what it represents um, is a dream uh, that Peter had when he was a child. Um, I think his family were moving house um, and he had a dream about travelling um, on the back of a giant eel. Um, but he doesn't travel alone. Uh, he travels um, with his family. And I think this is probably um, an important place um, to say that this talk today is not um, authored um, and, and written entirely by me. This, this, this story has been inspired um, and sort of brought together by people I've worked with over the years, so I've, I've put up those people who've particularly inspired and helped me um, in the, the creation of this talk today. But of course, it does rest on the contributions um, of many people over the years who I would like to thank by name, but I, I, I won't be able to today. Um, I'll put a lot of names up at the end. Um, but you know, if, you, if you have been involved in this work and you are watching this talk, um, then um, thank you very much because it's been a, it's been a fantastic journey so far. Um, now, I'd like to talk a little about me to start with. I work at the Centre for Environment, Fisheries and Aquaculture Science in CFAS. Um, it's an organisation that's been in existence for about 120 years. I've been working there for 23 of them to sort of partly answer Gustav's question um, at the start. Um, and over the years, I've, I've been lucky enough to work on a number of different species. Um, the, the European eel, which is probably the most interesting. Um, so I'll just put a little um, sort of a marker there to show where CFAS is. Um, this is my journey um, over the last couple of days. Um, I took a train to London um, and a flight into Stockholm, um, about 1,600 kilometres um, in total. There's my track there, all collected um, on my mobile phone through the GPS system. And I think this is a really good uh, moment, perhaps, to sort of point out that we've become very used to the idea of tracking in our lives. So we track ourselves, our children, our animals. We track our post. Uh, we use uh, these kind of geographic tools on a daily basis. Um, it's something that has become possible really through the use of the global positioning system, uh, which was allowed for public use from about 1999, but we've become particularly reliant on over the last five or 10 years. But it was not always thus. Um, it has become um, a very common tool for the study of animal populations as well. So here's an example. This is, a brilliant, uh, this is from a brilliant book called Animals on the Move. This shows some, some tracking um, of baboons um, from um, various different places and into the habitats they use. This is the, the, the book if you're interested. But again, it's not always been possible to work like this. It's not always possible to work like this um, in all environments, and the sea is a particularly poor place uh, to try and study animal migrations using GPS, because of course GPS does not work underwater. So at this point, I want you to imagine a creature that you cannot track, a creature that is mysterious and unknown, and has been unknown for some two and a half thousand years. Um, I want you to think of an eel, um, and if you have uh, children or grandchildren, this is a brilliant book, um, published. It's about the American eel, actually, not the topic of today's talk, but many of the principles um, are the same. It's incredible to think... Hang on. Let me just check. Oh, here we go. It's going again. Um, it's amazing to think um, that, a, that a creature that is so ubiquitous, so widespread across Europe um, and North Africa, has, you know, for so many thousands of years, which has been a, a sort of a bedrock of trade, um, you know, of our culture um, and, you know, as, as a food is still unknown today um, in terms of the completion of its life cycle. In fact, one of the, the great eel scientists, the Dane, Johann Schmidt, I was warned not to sort of make too much of the Danish connection, but it's impossible um, with the, the life history of the eel not, not to spend a lot of time talking about Johann Schmidt, um, who writes this brilliant quote in a paper published in Nature in 1922. Um, and I'll read it out. Um, we know then that the old eels vanish from our ken into the sea, and that the sea sends us in return innumerable hosts of elvers. But whither have they wandered, these old eels? 
and whence have the elders come? And that really you know, has been a question that people have been asking for thousands of years. It's not a new question. Aristotle, in 350 BC, was posing exactly the same question. And there's a much used quote, actually, um, that eels are derived from the guts of the earth. Um, now, what he meant by this was um, that eels could generate seemingly out of nowhere um, from the mud and so on. And his observation wasn't just based on the fact that um, you know, eels would seem to appear in these places, but also on anatomical investigations and the fact that he could not find any evidence for sexual reproduction in eels. Um, and it's no great surprise that that wasn't possible, and I'll come to explain that later, but it's something that people were looking for um, for many, many years, including even Sigmund Freud, who until, you know, that's a relatively recent time for someone um, you know, of such scientific stature to look and to fail to find evidence of something that should be really so obvious. Now, um, I think you know, in Sweden, the sort of science of eels and understanding of eels is, is actually quite widespread. Uh, many of you will have come across this book, known to me um, as, as the Gospel of the Eels. And if you do have any sort of wider interest in eel science and how eels impact culture, and in particular how they might even impact on your life um, or other people's lives, then this is a brilliant book um, to read. And I'll, I'll stop um, talking about the wider history of eels here, but I do want to pick up now at the very start of the journey of eel tracking um, and why it was so difficult uh, to understand that life cycle and how that, um, the studies towards tracking eels to the Sargasso Sea were unlocked. So I'm going to start um, with an Italian, Giovanni Grassi. Here he is on the left, and here's um, one of the drawings he got one of his colleagues to make of a species known as Leptocephalus brevirostris. Quite an impressive looking creature, transparent, jelly-like, um, and found um, in the ocean. Very large teeth. Now what Grassi noticed and what helped unlock um, the, some of the mysteries of the eel and helped us start moving towards an understanding of how to track them to their spawning areas um, was the fact that he noticed that this species, um, which had been described only about 50 years earlier, did in fact metamorphose into another species. Um, and that species was in fact the European eel. Uh, not only did Grassi find these leptocephali in the ocean, but he actually, having caught some, watched them trans transmorph into um, glass eels, which are the early life form um, of eels. He actually did um, a bit more than that, in fact. Um, he, he made some really rather insightful comments about how eels might reproduce and where they might reproduce, but much of that has been forgotten, mainly because his studies, having been um, sort of almost solely confined to the Mediterranean on moray eels and their life cycle, um, he concluded that eels uh, spawned and reproduced in the Mediterranean. Um, and the reason why um, that was proven to be false, I'll come to in a minute. Um, but he quite elegantly describes you know, why um, and how this leptocephalus larvae transforms into a European eel. He also said, as I, as I mentioned, that um, he had, there were some insights about how eels reproduced in the deep ocean um, in the same paper. Um, but it was really this, this discovery of the metamorphosis that allowed people to start understanding where eels might spawn in the wider ocean. And at this point, I want to start talking um, about Johann Schmidt. Um, who was a Dane, he started conducting oceanic surveys initially with ICES um, in the early part of the 20th century and then later became funded by the Carlsberg Foundation to fund even wider surveys across the entirety of the Atlantic. And he too uh, was particularly interested in leptocephali, uh, but he knew, unlike Rassi, that they occurred not just in the Mediterranean, um, but across the wider Atlantic um, and in large numbers. And he had collected a whole series um, of leptocephali in various different states of transformation. You can see here, um, we started um, at uh, sort of the late juvenile form, and here's the, the transformation of that leptocephalus, or, or the leptocephali series, into um, an elva and a glass eel. Okay, so he too understood that the leptocephali trans transformed into, into eels, and he then understood how, if he started to look for these leptocephali elsewhere in the ocean, you know, how he might have tracked them down 
And the reason why I'm focusing a lot on Schmidt and on this leptocephalus transformation is because for me, this is the start of the eel tracking journey. It's not necessarily about tracking individuals, but it's about tracking eels towards the Sargasso Sea. Um, and Schmidt said, you know, um, quite eloquently here, that I perceived if the problem were to be solved in anything like a satisfactory manner, it would be necessary to ascertain not only where the youngest larvae were to be found, but also where they were not. And so, I mean, he wrote this in, in 1922, a paper published in Nature. Um, he published a series of papers over that, the course of that time, but it started his investigations in around 1904. So over 18 years, he pursued his goal. This is one of the first papers published in 1912. Um, I'll just ex take a moment to explain this. The size of these, um, these black dots here um, is inverse to the size of larvae that he found. So the smaller the dot, the larger the larvae. And what he was able to show with his oceanic survey series was that the larger larvae here were along the coastal shelf and in the Mediterranean, and the smaller larvae were out in the middle of the Atlantic. So they couldn't, uh, eels couldn't spawn in the Mediterranean because no small larvae were found in the Mediterranean, only these larger individuals here. Uh, he published again in 1922 um, with another sort of similar analysis, but this time he managed to map out um, the larvae to such an extent uh, that he was able to sort of put, if you like, this sort of bullseye effect um, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, showing here um, in the Sargasso Sea, um, in the West Atlantic, where the smallest larvae were. So he's tracking these larvae from large to small all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and this, for me, um, is, is Schmidt's finest work. Um, this is his sort of final publication in the series in 1923 in Proceedings of the Royal Society, where he shows um, that this bullseye, this, so these concentric circles of larvae are centered on the Sargasso Sea, the very largest larvae lying outside of, of these areas, and therefore that this um, is, is the spawning location um, of the European eel. Um, so, that was 1923. Um, what have we found out since? Um, well, before we kind of get into that, <laughs> um, Let's take, a, let's, let's take a moment to think about what between them, Grassi um, and, um, and Schmidt, had helped us with. Um, so, so we'll have a look at the life cycle now, which is quite complex and, and, and quite a marvelous thing. So they'd focused on the leptocephalus stage. Grassi had shown that the leptocephali transform into glacials, and of course everyone knows that glacials transform into elvers. This is well understood. This part of the life cycle is easily observed um, in fresh water. Um, you know, and, and, and so on. Um, and we know then that elvers grow um, into yellow eels and at some point they will turn into silver eels. Um, but we still haven't figured out what happens in between the silver eel stage and the leptocephalus stage. So 1923, that's 100 years ago, uh, we must have found what happens in between these two essential stages here. Um, well, I'll just show you a plot of all of the data collected from, from the larval surveys um, s during the time of Schmidt and subsequently. Okay, so these, these data are plotted, they're plotted on a grid basis, um, and what they show is the size of larvae collected um, in different colors based on this, this gridded basis, with the yellow dots here being the smallest larvae, the red slightly larger, blue slightly larger, black slightly larger still, and then gray the very largest. And if I just put on that same series of concentric rings that Schmidt drew on his paper in 1923, you can see that not very much has changed really. Um, and that's why I like Schmidt's plot so much. It's essentially still state of the art, even 100 years later. That's how great his surveys were. That's how good um, those science was. That's how well he tracked eels um, to their spawning location. Now, I'm, I'm perhaps not being fair to the many generations of eel scientists who've surveyed for eels in the Sargasso Sea in saying that Schmidt's work is still state of the art, uh, because many refinements have been made and many great discoveries have been made, but essentially the story is still the same. Uh, European eels spawn in the Sargasso Sea and their larvae must migrate back um, to Europe and then settle there for periods of years before they then begin their onward migration. What you'll notice here, there's no other symbols apart from these, these dots to show where the larvae would be collected. You'd have thought, wouldn't you, that in a hundred years it would have been possible for someone to have fished out a silver eel to have found some sort of evidence of a spawning eel in all of that time. But no, no eel has ever been caught in the ocean. That's full stop, not just the Sargasso Sea, but the whole Atlantic Ocean. No egg of an eel has ever been found. 
the only thing which we've got here is the evidence that eels spawn their larvae, but not the actual spawning eels themselves. So it's no wonder that this is still a mystery. And of course, as scientists driven by curiosity, we want to know um, how, this, um, how this whole story plays out. So what do we need to do? We need to look for a silver eel. Um, it's 100 years of fishing in the Sargasso Sea, haven't found them. What does a silver eel look like? It's probably worth thinking about what that looks like so we can get some sort of search image in our minds and think about how we might go about finding that. So I'll just give you a few sort of characteristics. Now, Schmidt's work established that eels have to swim a long, long way to get to their spawning area. So from the Mediterranean, that's about 9,000 kilometers at maximum, but probably you know, across the range, there's an average of about 5,000 kilometers to swim. Now, I started talking about my journey here of 1,600 kilometers, which was assisted by a car, a train, a plane, a car, and so on and so forth. The eel has to do this all under its own steam. And actually, it's quite unique in amongst these long-distance migrators. See if you look, the top distances are achieved by large fish um, of this sort of, you know, th that are sharks that have very powerful uh, swimming motions and very large bodies and so on that can able to propel them over that huge distance. Those just below the eel are all sort of torpedo-shaped fish, and so we've got this large um, sort of well, this large distance to be travelled, but with a body form that's very different. Um, to the species that also uh, migrate over very large distances. So it's quite unique um, in that respect. Silver eels um, are you know, silver in places, but they're not completely silver. Um, here's an exa this example here shows, I, th I hope you can see that nicely, the sort of silver coloration on the underside, but the, s the surface, the dorsal surface of it is actually quite dark and black. This is classic counter shading coloration, which shows that the eel is adapted for life in the deep ocean. So if a predator views it from below, it only sees the lighter surface um, from the belly up. If the predator is looking down, it sees this darker surface, which helps to disguise the eel. Um, in that deep ocean. The other thing is these large, beautiful blue eyes here um, that the eels have um, that are full, as we know from, from anatomical examination, of rods um, that can detect blue light. So they have very large eyes for seeing very low light levels. So we know they're pre-adapted even before they leave our shores for life in deep water. Um, and we also know that they're not yet mature. And we know that because countless scientists have got frustrated at trying to find any evidence of reproductive organs in eels as they, um, as they leave the sea. This photo here um, is a sort of classic photo. It was taken in an aquarium. These eels were matured using hormones and eventually spawned in an aquarium. But no one's ever seen this happen in, um, in real life, as it were, in, in the wild. Um, and so when eels leave, they are not mature. They mature on their journey. So they've got to swim about 5,000 kilometers, and they've got to mature on the way. They've got to find mates and reproduce. Um, and they do that all in the deep ocean, much as Grassi had surmised from his own observations. Um, so quite difficult to find. How do we find those in the deep ocean? Well, perhaps we shouldn't really think about trying to find them in the deep ocean. Maybe we should turn that sort of logic on its head. If we remember, Schmidt found where the spawning area was, not by looking for spawning eels, but by looking for the evidence that they left behind, the larval eels. Maybe we can think about things in a different way. Let's not go to the Sargasso to look for silver eels. Let's take the silver eels where we can find them as they escape, as they move from the rivers into the sea, and then try and relocate them in some way and follow them to the Sargasso Sea that way. Now, this idea of identifying and then relocating individuals is quite common um, in ecology. Um, you know, an example uh, for those who aren't um, fish followers among you, you know, would be the idea of bird ringing um, and marking a bird, which can then be identified later from the color or the number on that ring. Fish tagging has a similar basis. You put a small mark um, or a tag onto a fish. Um, in this case, there's an eel shown here. Um, and then it will be, could be recaptured later by a fisher or observed in some way, and then its location marked. Now, this is great, of course, um, if you're able to catch the fish. One thing about eels um, is that they are quite um, slippery creatures, and they're quite narrow creatures. They can escape trawls and so on. 
Um, the kind of nets you need to catch a f an eel are particularly specific, and you can find these um, along the coast. And so here is some, some work summarized by Nicholas Schoberg, um, who's in the audience today, if you want to talk to him about this, um, showing how migration paths of eels through the Baltic have been determined using tagged eels um, caught in, in fike and pound nets. But this is a very unusual case, in a way, because once eels escape to the ocean, they cannot be found um, in nets. Um, so now I'd like to talk about the second, ale, second age of eel tracking now, um, which is how we find fish um, that have been tagged, but which are not, do not need to be recorded. We need to find a way um, of, of tagging the eels so that we can capture them without catching them. And the way we recatch them is by using sound. Um, and we've heard today from Jordan, who explained to us the principles of acoustic telemetry, so I won't go into uh, too much about that, but I'll just mention two different types of telemetry that can be used um, to track fish. One is sort of active uh, tagging, where a tag um, attached to a fish, this isn't an eel, by the way, this is a cod, uh, but it was the only diagram I had. Um, so a tagged fish is insonified by a sonar beam and then sends a message back um, to the to, to the boat that has um, insonified it, and therefore it's actively tracked. Um, it's a sort of call and answer system. There's another type of tag, and this is the kind of tag that um, Jordan was talking about today, sort of passive tag, where a tag will send out a ping that can be detected by a hydrophone. This is not to scale. Um, and uh, in this way, the people who are working aboard the vessel um, can listen for the fish and track it. Now, you do need skilled personnel um, to do this. You need people um, who can steer a boat, who can listen for a fish, um, and who can give directions in order to be able to follow it. Um, so I like to include this slide when I talk about acoustic tracking. This is some of my um, former colleagues um, and other sort of um, other famous trackers who um, were out on a, on a cruise out of, um, on a survey I should say, out of Lowestoft on the, on the Cleone. Um, here they are. I won't give their names here. Um, if you want to know, I can tell you later. Um, but the point I'd really like to make um, is about you know, the, the skills and the, and the attributes you need um, to be able to track fish using this kind of technology. Because once again, it's important to remember that technology wasn't as it is now, but as it used to be. Um, so here, we have the hardware, um, which is where the tags being followed on a screen. We have our flash memory here, um, that where the results are being scribbled on. And of course, this is the most important thing um, in all of this, and I'd like to emphasize this, is the software needed to be able to track those fish. It's exactly the same um, if you're doing, um, so that, that, that those, um, those photos were taken during uh, tracking of um, a fish tag with an acoustic transponder tag. Here um, we have preparations being made for uh, tracking a fish using just a passive um, acoustic tag. So, so we have Hawk and Vesterberg here, who again is in the audience. Um, it doesn't look quite like this anymore. Um, but this is from the early days in the 1980s. Um, so you can see Hawken here uh, is preparing the hydrophone. That's this device here, which is then installed off the side of the vessel, um, which we're now at sea. You can see that. And then this is a really most important thing for when you're tracking eels. Um, quite often, you can only really hear them um, at night. So lots of hard work, a big team required, and lots of skill to listen to um, and navigate along tracking um, those individuals that have been tagged. Um, now, some of the early work with acoustic tracking in, in eels happened in the North Sea, not in the ocean. Um, I'm mentioning this here because the early work, um, which was driven a lot by uh, the scientist uh, Frederick Tesch, a German, um, was based in the North Sea, and it, the real focus of interest was on, on navigation. But in a way, and for poetic license here, I'm going to say this was practice. Um, for the real business of tracking eels, which was done later, which was in the ocean. Now, here's a track um, of an individual um, that was tagged in the, in the Western um, Mediterranean. Um, and these will become quite familiar to you, I hope, this kind of plot. Um, so I'll just spend a moment to explain it to save me a bit of time later. Uh, what we can see down the, the y-axis here is the depth that the individual is at. And what we can see here is the time. Um, so this is just a continuous time here. So we've got about sort of two days of tracking here. The light bars here show daytime, the black bar night, daytime, nighttime, daytime. And in this case, because this fish is being actively tracked um, and the vessel has um, a, um, a sounder to determine the depth of the seabed level, we also get where that seabed is. And the key point here really is that eels seem to descend to great depths during the daytime, ascend um, into the water column at night, descend again in the day, ascend at night. Now, 
We talked a little bit about those beautiful eyes that eels have. Um, and there's a point here to, to make about the different zones of the ocean. This upper limit, in very, very clear water, you might see visible light down to about 80 meters if it's very, very clear water. Below that, uh, we have the dysphotic zone, where really the only light that can be seen is, is, is very low level blue light. And what you can see here, just for the fact I've grayed this out, is for the most, most of the time, eels are traveling in almost complete darkness. They can only detect blue light if that. Um, certainly, we wouldn't be able to detect any light at all um, at these depths. Um, the second point I should probably make here is the eel is, of course, going down to sort of 300, uh, 400 meters here. As another example, and this one's not so clear, unfortunately, but um, you can probably get um, the idea. We see this um, amazing vertical migration from deep water to shallow water, deep water to shallow water on a daily basis. But this time, the eel, again in the Western Mediterranean, is now away from the seabed. Um, but it's maintaining station in these depths at about 500 meters, but still coming up into shallower water. Um, so here again, uh, we have that dysphotic zone. For almost the entire time here, that eel is in almost complete darkness. Um, so I'll summarize here, um, at the end of the age of acoustic tracking, which, uh, this, this work was done in the sort of the mid 80s. Um, and I think I just you know, should say again, just how much skill it takes to track um, an individual like this. This is a golden data set, um, if you like. Uh, seven days of tracking an eel, listening for a ping from a small tag in an individual that is hundreds of meters away and following it for a full week. Imagine, um, you know, some of you have children, grandchildren, possibly um, if you don't, then you might have dogs or pets or something like that. Imagine tracking them when they were hundreds of meters away from you, by only be able to listen every few minutes for a tiny little sound that they made and being able to determine the direction of that and doing that for a period of seven days. Uh, I can't imagine how hard that would be. I, wouldn't have, I would have loved to have watched it, but I wouldn't have liked to have done it. Um, you know, so how are we going to be able to track eels you know, over the sort of... 10-month-long period of their migration, or six months, whatever, using this kind of technology. It's impossible. We need to find an even less direct method of looking for eels. We need to find a way of, of a tag that can collect this information without the need for that tracking team. And that's when we enter the third age, if you like, of eel tracking. Uh, and that's the age we're still in. Um, so I'm going to be bringing us up to the present here. And I hope I've got enough time. Just, have to just give me another 10, if you would. Um, so. Um, and this is about archival tagging. And archival tags are tags that record information and store it on board. Relatively simple. You need a clock, you need um, a memory, um, and you need some sensors. And the clock wakes up the sensors every few minutes. Um, they take a measurement and they record the data to the memory. Here's, a, here's some data from a place. This is one of the earliest ever archival tags uh, that was um, deployed and recovered. It's on a place in the Southern North Sea. But the point I'm, I'm want you to understand here is that you get very similar data to the kind of data we can get from um, an acoustic tag, um, but all of this is recorded on board, and this information only comes to us once that tag um, has been recovered. Um, but look at it, brilliant. For a few hundred pounds, you can just put a tag on a fish, release it, and then you get all this beautiful, rich um, information. This, this work was done um, sort of in the late 80s, um, and, and, and you know, subsequent um, work has been done on place ever since. Amazing, we've got our solution, haven't we? The problem is that with archival tag, you need to get the tag back in order to download the data. So how do you get this information back from an eel? Well, let's go back to the Baltic. Um, and here we have the first um, sort of published data on the behavior of eels in the Baltic using archival tags. I'm hawking again here, um, so pioneering again in the Baltic. And what we can see here, um, you know, if you can um, see, they've got time along the top again, sort of, uh, and each one of the days is numbered. You can see that at the top. Depths here, relatively shallow in this case, because um, we're in coastal Baltic waters. And again, the key thing to notice is we have these periods of activity here, denoted by these uh, the black lines, and then periods of inactivity. You probably won't be surprised to learn, based on the data that I've showed you before, that these periods of inactivity correspond to daytime. So the eel's inactive during the day, um, but active during at night. But another innovation here is the introduction of geolocation techniques. So using the information available from the tag, 
um, the depth and the times of activities to try and estimate the location along the duration of the track. So even though we have the release point up here um, and the recapture point shown in red here, these tracks here along the coast have been reconstructed using that really simple information derived from the tag. But what we need is something, once the eels get out into the ocean, that gives us a better idea of where they are and gets the data back to us independently. And for that, we had to wait for the pop-up satellite archival tag, which transmits data. And here is now when we can start to really um, look into the oceanic lives of eels in a significant way. Um, now, these aren't small devices. You can see from the picture here, this is the AA battery. Um, and here's the tag. So you can see that's a reasonably sizable device. You're probably all familiar with these, I hope. Um, in order to be able to tag eels and to track eels using these kind of devices, we therefore needed to use only the very largest eels. Um, so there's a plot here. This little uh, line here shows a size distribution you typically get in Europe um, of male eels. There is no way we can put one of these tags on a male eel. But the very biggest females, shown here by this thicker line, um, those sort of 95 centimeters or above, would be possible um, to use these tags on. So if you can find enough large eels, um, you will be able to do the job. Now these tags are quite capable. They'll record data and store data um, and transmit that back um, at a period of about fi every 15 minutes, and they'll be able to do that for about 10 months. So actually, that's the, that's the duration of the migration that we calculated before from this uh, work from Tesh. So with a bit of luck, we should be able to do that. Um, so my colleagues, um, Kim Arastrup here um, on the right with Finn Auckland um, in the middle here in 2006, um, here's Cedar Chittenden, who was, who was helping at the time. Um, they went to Ireland, the western margin um, of Europe, and tagged um, about eight eels with these pop-up satellite tags and released them as part of the Galathea uh, expedition in 2006. Um, this is what a tagged eel looked like um, as it was escaping um, and um, heading it into the ocean. And here are the data that were collected from that pioneering experiment. So there's only eight eels, relatively um, small scale, a pilot experiment, if you would. Um, but you can see uh, you know, from this plot, here's where the eels were released off the west coast of Ireland. And they were heading in a southwesterly direction. Some uh, were tracked for up to six months um, over that period. Um, and we got two um, pop-ups you know, to the southwest here, um, around about 1,000 kilometers away. Sorry, 2,000 kilometers away. Um, and we also observed some predation events as shown by these crosses. But this is a massive, massive advance because the experiments that were done with acoustic tracking in the 1970s and 1980s only generated a few tens uh, of data from many years of effort. In one tagging experiment with eight fish, um, we've got more than 300 days of data um, already on the oceanic lives of eels. And here's, oh, sorry, I skipped past this. Um, and here's uh, what those data look like that came back from those tags. What can we see? Well, again, we've got the stereotypical deal vertical migration. I've colored the data here so you can see uh, how the temperature changes over that. And you can see that this is regular as clockwork. And that's a really key point, this, this timing um, of the migration, because that helps us locate them. I'm not sure I'm going to have too much time to talk about that, but I can talk to you about it um, outside of the lecture. Um, but this, this, this clockwork behavior, if you like, helps us to, to locate where the eels are to a certain extent. But once again, we see exactly the same thing from the eels. Uh, in shallow water at night, sorry, and in deep, very deep water by day, around about 500 meters here, around about 600 meters here. So these eels are experiencing cold, dark conditions during the day and warmer um, conditions um, at night. Um, but the great thing about this is these data have not been collected using a research vessel and a team of scientists. It's a tag deployed on a single fish. Um, in 2008, we were lucky enough to put together a proposal to fund a program called the ELIAD, um, which um, in part had um, you know, um, sort of been generated in response to the, the sort of classification of eels onto the red list, the CITES red list, which classified them as endangered and therefore species of particular concern um, for conservation. Um, and that sort of gave a bit of impetus to this kind of tracking work to understand why eels uh, were declining in the ocean. Do you say we've got 10 minutes? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to have to skip through a little bit faster here. Um, 
But we needed, the, the, the idea of this, this project was to bring together multidisciplinary teams from across Europe to try and tackle this problem of eel migration on a larger scale and with greater numbers than before. We need a lot of eels to do so. Um, but we succeeded. Um, and here's an example um, of, a, of a satellite data set that we collected from an eel tagged in Sweden. Um, so there's about six months of data here. Um, you can see that that um, you know, looks very similar to the previous tracks, with time in deep water, time in shallow water again, uh, that deal vertical migration. Um, we also deployed these things called flotsam tags um, during the project, which were not satellite tags, but which were tags designed to float back to us after they'd been released from the eel to be found by beachcombers. This was not a genuine finding. This is a staged photo. Um, but it was a staged photo in the hope that others would find them in, in this, such a situation. It turned out not to be such um, a bad idea after all. This was a tag found on the Lofoten Islands um, by somebody called Roger Mees. Um, from an eel that migrated um, north from the Baltic. And this is the kind of data set which we could collect from them. So again, really rich, and again, you can see this deal vertical migration throughout the course of the track. Um, this was persistent. At the end of the project, we'd collected some um, 200 data sets from eels, um, encompassing more than 8,000 days of data. And the commonality, again, is this deal vertical migration. There's three different areas shown here. Eel tagged in the Celtic Sea, the Baltic Sea and the Mediterranean, all eels do the same thing. Um, and they separate out into these nighttime shallow depths and these daytime deep depths. Um, every eel, it seems, is programmed to do the same thing. Um, and here's the map that we put together of their migrations. So from those 7,000 days of data, we were able to, to reconstruct not just the end points, which are shown by these crosses, but also some of the intermediate points, which you can see scattered here, these sort of light gray points. Um, there's two things about this plot um, that I'd like to, to sort of mention and why we didn't succeed in getting eels all the way to the Sargasso Sea. The first is that eels travel relatively slowly. Um, so their migration speeds, although they go up to sort of 45 to 50 kilometers a day, averaged out at about sort of 15 to 20 kilometers per day. So the same sorts of speeds that were observed in that second age of tracking. Um, so it's a slow road to the Sargasso Sea. The second thing is, it's a dangerous road. What this plot shows um, is the behavior of an eel up to this point, but where these dots turn red um, is where the eel has been consumed by a predator. Um, it's no longer an eel at this point. Uh, we believe it's a blue shark. Um, and this was something that um, disappointed us greatly um, as part of our tagging experiments, because what we found, coming back to this plot here, all these crosses that are not uh, colored black were predations or probable predations. And that predation was particularly heavy along the coastal margins. So we weren't able uh, to track the eels as far as we would have liked, firstly, because they don't travel very fast, and secondly, because they're vulnerable to predation when they go. We could get one eel about as far as the Azores, but that was um, the best we could manage. Halfway there. Um, but nevertheless, because the eels were swimming relatively slowly, um, this eel here took 10 months to get to the Azores. Remember, the, the capacity and the capability of those tags is only 10 months. So we couldn't quite get there, even with, um, even with the best conditions, because the eels simply don't swim fast enough. So where do you go if you want to get even further towards the Sargasso? Well, let's look in a different way again. This is where we're trying to track across. Where can we find that's a bit of a staging point? We've tried from the western edge of Europe, so let's go a little bit closer. And if we zoom in here, we'll find that there are some islands in the middle of the Atlantic called the Azores. And this is the most recent uh, tracking experiments that have been conducted using satellite tags. Um, and I'll quickly run through those because I know that Gustav wants me to finish. You wouldn't think um, that these p conditions in the Azores would be particularly great um, for harboring eels. And this was one of the big questions about this expedition. Even though the Azores are in the ideal position, um, for trapping and then tracking eels to the uh, Sargasso, would there be any there? And the first year in 2017 was based all around that. I'll just show some more photos. Fantastic scenery. Um, is it hospitable to eels? Um, maybe. I mean, here are a couple of different um, rivers. They don't look like um, they might be capable of harboring eels or that they're particularly good conditions for harboring lots of eels. Um, but the team that was out there, so Andy Don here, so he's putting together a couple of fight nets near what looks like might be good habitat. Um, 
and then other colleagues who, who spent a lot of effort in 2017 hacking through vegetation and, and putting down eel traps to try and find some. Did they find eels? Well, we tried with eDNA too. Um, and yes, was the answer. Eels do exist on the Azores. Um, lovely looking creatures they are. This is a fantastic looking yellow eel. But also silver eels, that big blue eye there, and the silver coloration. So yes, silver eels are found on the Azores. And it has to be said that the team was very pleased that they um, had, had found them at the end. Um, so so it, um, well done um, to the team out there in 2017. It wasn't until 2018, however, that they could go back um, and tag a silver eel um, and um, release them to sea. What did they find? Um, so I'm just going to go back a little uh, to remind you of where we've got to. So from Sweden here um, and, uh, and Denmark, we've got eels that come down um, through this Nordic route here. Um, from the Celtic Sea, we've got eels that swim out into the Central Atlantic, from the Mediterranean through the Gibraltar Straits and towards um, the Azores. And here are those Azores, the first tagging in 2018. Two data sets. They head west, they cross the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. 2019, more tagging, more pop-ups um, to the west, getting closer and closer. Um, and here um, is the figure we published last year um, to show that um, we had actually tracked eels into the Sargasso Sea, which is shown by this, this hashed area here. Um, there are five in total, um, as outlined here, including one eel um, that got all the way uh, to where the, the spawning area is as defined by this collection of um, dots here. These are, sh these are, these are the data uh, going all the way back to Schmidt and subsequently all of the larval data that exist for uh, the European eel and the Sargasso Sea. So yes, we've made it. Um, amazing. Not, you know, perhaps not um, as many eels got there as we'd hoped, but again, one of the problems is that eels swim relatively slowly. Even after 360 days, um, they only got to this sort of point. Um, and to get to the, the spawning area, they'll need about another 100 days or so. So the tags still aren't capable. Do they do the same thing as eels from elsewhere? Well, yes. Here we go. So here's a seven-month track. You'll see exactly the same thing again from, from this data set. Shallow water um, during the nighttime and deeper water during the daytime. So similar behaviors, even uh, though they originate in the Azores and they're getting closer to the Sargasso. Um, so 15 years um, of rapid progress using these, these uh, satellite transmitting tags. Um, and what we can say is you know, that we've recorded longer and longer migrations. You know, we have more and more data to understand the, the, the behavior of eels. Um, they go more slowly than expected, um, but in part that may be due to this daily vertical migration, which seems to be a fundamental element um, of, of eel behavior um, and has helped us to get there. Um, just to recap, and it is only just a couple of minutes, I've got that. Um, so th these three main ages, every age has been driven forward by innovation, um, you know, by a new survey technique or new idea about how to track eels um, to the Sargasso Sea. It's all expeditionary science. Um, it's getting out there, doing things, taking a risk on something you don't know will work, um, and finding out along the way whether it does or not. And we've made many mistakes, but we've also achieved many successes. And, that, and one thing, you know, that's certainly true um, as we get um, you know, into the more modern age of science is that the teams you need to do this kind of work are increasingly multidisciplinary and increasingly international. Um, and it's, it's been the great pleasure of my career to be able to work amongst these teams um, and to be able to uncover some of these secrets. Um, just my final reflections, really. Eels are pretty elusive. They have been for two and a half thousand years. Um, it's really important, I think, to remember that you know, we, the things we do know and the things we don't know um, and eels are, are particularly good at reminding you of that um, in our sort of modern you know, and connected world that they still defy us uh, to understand in full their life cycle. Um, but we have got a long way and we do understand what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. A um, lot of secrets still to uncover. Um, and I think one of the things that we do need to recognize um, amongst all of that is that these secrets are important to help us conserve the European eel. Schmidt would have found it inconceivable when he was doing his surveys that we could go from a species that was ubiquitous across Europe and Europe, sorry, Northern Europe, Europe and North Africa um, to a situation where we now have a species that's critically endangered. I mean, if there's one takeaway that I'd like you to take from this lecture is that, you know, 
if you've got a sense of wonder or a, a sense of amazement about how this species behaves, you know, take that with you. Help um, to do something uh, to, to secure the future of that species so that future generations may also experience that wonder and that astonishment um, because we've been lucky enough to, to, to see that through our lifetimes. I'll end here um, with a note from Schmidt. Again, he is so quotable. Um, Altogether, the whole story of the eel and its spawning has come to read almost like a romance, where in reality has far exceeded the dreams of fantasy. And I would echo that. Reality far exceeds fantasy. So whilst we continue to understand the eel and uncover its mysteries, I believe that that reality makes the eel even more interesting than it would be and would be that we can imagine. So thank you very much for listening. Amazing stuff, really, thank you. Great talk, David. So I'm not really sure we have enough time for, do we? Yeah, awesome. So we have enough time for questions. So questions? Yep, let me hear first. Uh, I'm Bo Fernholm uh, of this uh, museum. Uh, the eels must be feeding while they migrate this long way. Do we have any idea of, on what they feed? I'm glad you brought that up uh, because I wasn't, um, I wasn't able to squeeze that into the talk. In fact, I think I squeezed more in uh, than maybe I should have done. So my apologies if I've run over time. Um, eels do not feed on their migration. When they, when they leave the rivers, or they leave the coast, their stomachs have degenerated, so their stomachs are only capable of absorbing water and not food. So this deal vertical migration is not based around searching for food. Um, it is related to something else, and that is something that we don't know. Um, so another mystery, uh, really. But, but one thing worth bearing in mind, they travel 5,000 kilometers on an empty stomach. All of that migration has to be done with the food stores that they have when they leave, so in the fat that they have stored in their tissues. They also have to become mature enough to reproduce on those same reserves. So if anything, it makes it a more remarkable journey for knowing that. So thank you for asking the question. Yeah, thank you very much for the overview here. And uh, I, I, um, I, I just want to follow up on that question. Have you ever considered uh, a farm the eel that, that you feed to get as big as possible to help him carry this uh, logger s or transmitter and then put it out just because then he would be um, have enough extra um, energy to carry this and maybe um, so, I, so I think I understand you. Should we, should we try and feed the eels up oh, in no. order to make them better able to complete their migration with the tag? Yes, if you have, uh, there is uh, uh, eel farming, so then if you could uh, put out some of the biggest eels from there, they would have uh, maybe a good chance. Uh, yes, so I mean the eels we, we, we would use have been caught under natural conditions um, and are ready to migrate to the sea. Um, and, and, and to escape and to travel across the Atlantic. So um, it's probably very important for us uh, to work with those eels rather than eels that have been held in different sorts of conditions so that we get that natural behavior. They, are, they have become silver eels and they're ready to go. Um, we could not make them in any better condition uh, to achieve that migration because they are already in the best possible condition and in the state they need to be. Um, but also by this point, they are already incapable of absorbing food. Um, so people have tried using yellow eels and making them into silver eels using hormones, so taking the, the very large ones. They've also tried taking them across the Atlantic and releasing them with tags on to see what they do um, near the Sargasso Sea. But again, that is an unnatural um, sort of, uh, well, I'm trying to think of the right words. You know, that, that way of doing it um, you know, may impact their behavior um, and, and what you're able to record more than um, just taking them from where they are ready to escape and watching them go to the Sargasso Sea. Um, but an interesting idea, thank you. Yes, yeah, no, a very interesting idea. It, it, I see what you mean, so it may help to conserve stocks or something like this, yeah. All right.
I have a super short question just before, because I need to ask it. So, I mean, you close sort of the migration gap now, you say, I mean, and you have, do you, although not sort of a single migration, but so what do you think would be sort of the next big step for you guys? What's the next mystery to solve? What's the next golden data point to, to actually have? There's many. Um, I think that the f what will the fourth age of eel tracking be? I think it could be a return to the Sargasso using more modern methods, so like the eDNA methods that Naira talked about this morning, um, or um, yeah, um, or um, using observations, uh, remote vehicles, cameras, and so on. Um, but I think the challenges are until we know exactly where the eels are to be found and know what to look for, it's very difficult to know how to design techniques around that. Um, but I think navigation, spawning behavior, social behavior, what do the males do? Everything I talked about here has, has been based around the tracking of female eels because they are the ones that are large enough. The males are much smaller, only half the size. Mm -hmm. So who knows what the males do? So there's another big question there. All right. So thanks again, David.